I'm Althea Brooks, and I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the Office of Engagement. It's a pleasure to welcome you here for another More Than a Score talk. We have two more talks uh, after this one, and we're looking forward to seeing you at both of those programs. Um, a special, Teresa's having trouble hearing me at the very back, Cheon. Uh, we, uh, a special thanks to the Alumni Association, our partner for this program, and to our Lifetime Learning team, who's working every Saturday morning before the home football games. Uh, Teresa Gano, Dana Mays, Susan Lynch, they show up every Saturday morning. Of course, uh, Cindy Fried uh, Fredericks as well, my fearless leader. So special thanks. Please visit the Lifetime Learning website to uh, learn about our virtual programs uh, and our in-person programs. Visit engagement.virginia.edu backslash learn. Before we begin, go ahead and silence the ringer on your phone. Uh, we have microphones that will pass uh, for, this, um, for the Q&A portion of the program. Uh, and we ask that you ask just one question, one brief question, and uh, our speaker will try to address your, your question. Okay. I'm gonna do a brief introduction of Jennifer Beer. She's Associate Dean for Social Sciences and Professor of Sociology at the University of Virginia. She earned her PhD in Sociology from Duke University and her BA in International Studies um, uh, from John Hopkins University. She's an editor of the Journal Review of International Political Economy and co-editor of four books and the author of many articles. Professor Beer has conducted extensive research on global value chains and development, primarily in Latin America, but more recently also in South Asia. She has spoken about her research on these issues at the United Nations, European Parliament, and the International Labor Office. I'm gonna leave uh, Professor Beer with a question to um, address. Um, share with us a class that you have taught that have inspired your students and maybe um, will impact a change in our world. Okay? Please help me welcome Jennifer Beer to More Than the Score. Good morning. Um, so I want to start off just by thanking Althea and the whole Lifetime Learning team. It's really thrilling to be here. I pulled up, there was like rock music, there were people happening, uh, hanging out outside, and I thought I really need to figure out how to get, get in on this thing on a more regular basis. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about the future of work. I should say that I am uh, now, though a very happy Virginian, I am originally from Western Pennsylvania. And I need to give a shout out to Priya, who is a friend of mine from first grade, a WHO alum who got the announcement of this talk, and who I literally have not heard from in decades, who reached out to me. So that's very exciting. Um, but where Priya and I are from, we think um, a lot about the future of work, because Western Pennsylvania is obviously a part of the country that um, has been challenged by changes in um, both new technologies and the geography of production. And those are two things I'm going to talk about um, today. And I'm going to try to be brief, because I, I would really like to leave as much time as possible um, for Q&A. Um, but there's essentially sort of three themes that I'm going to touch on, not necessarily sequentially. Hopefully, these will be woven in um, throughout the talk. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of start off talking a little bit about the, the effect of technological change, kind of how we think about the consequences of new technologies, particularly so much of that is focused recently on automation, artificial intelligence, robotics. Um, I want to spend um, probably the bulk of the talk talking about what I think is actually extremely important, which is how those technologies intersect with economic globalization. Because um, I think to really understand the effect of technological change um, we really need to kind of put it in the context of these massive changes um, in the organization and the geography of global industries. And then hopefully some of what I'll say will also address in a more direct way the implications of these big changes, both um, at home in the US but also abroad. 
Um, okay, so there's been a lot of ink spilled, um, obviously, on the topic of the future of work. And there's such a range of opinions about the possibilities and the perils um, that the future is going to bring. It's really hard to make any um, very general arguments um, about that. But it does seem safe to say that particularly in recent years, so much of the discussion about the future of work centers in one way or another on technology and especially advances in automation and, and artificial intelligence. Robots, in particular, have loomed really large in our collective imagination about the future of work. Now, some are optimistic about this. Um, one line of thought is that automation is going to replace activities, jobs that people really don't want to do, or, or in fact, that we don't want people to do, jobs that are perhaps um, boring. But also, you know, really routine jobs can bring um, you know, concerns like repetitive stress injuries. Um, robots don't get carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, so the argument goes, it would be great to automate these jobs, especially if those that are displaced by automation can be retrained to do things like operate the robots, right? Um, so according to this view, you know, the future is one where kind of robots and humans work side by side, as this sort of cartoon showing robot and human construction workers suggests. Um, and this cartoon was actually taken from a Bloomberg story predicting a sort of, you know, a kind of optimistic scenario, a future of work in which humans and, and robots enjoy a kind of synergistic coexistence. There's also, though, a kind of what I'll call like a techno-pessimist view, um, and that is that we really should be very concerned about the labor displacing effects of automation that they're worrying, certainly not just for individual workers um, in this country and the communities in which they live, but also perhaps especially we should worry about this for developing countries because there is real concern that roboticization um, can displace workers in labor intensive manufacturing. Um, and I'm going to come back to this, but that's such an important area of the economy for developing countries, which is where I spend most of my time working. Now, in the US, a lot of this debate has really focused on um, technological change and its link to growing inequality. Um, and the main paradigm for thinking about this is uh, skill biased technological change or skill biased technical change. And it's a really simple idea. It basically says technological change isn't neutral in terms of who is affected by it, right? That it's really um, unskilled workers that tend to be um, most impacted by technological change. Whoops. Okay. Um, so again, one argument is, you know, technology simply is going to make skilled workers more productive and it's going to increase demand for them and their kinds of skills. Um, whereas technology for low skilled workers or, or what we tend to call unskilled workers, even though much of the work that these folks do is quite skilled, um, it's going to just replace them. Um, and they may not have the kinds of um, educational backgrounds or the ability to reskill um, of the sort that they would need to find work in uh, changing industries. Now, this is actually not a new debate at all. It's been around um, a really long time. Um, and there is a lot of variation um, in uh, thoughts about this problem. So there's just two recent articles, uh, one called Did Computers Create Inequality, which is a very kind of skeptical view, saying that actually technology has been around a really long time. Uh, we are overstating the risks that it poses, also maybe the benefits that it's generating. Um, whereas some economists, as this 20, 2022 article that I'm referencing here um, cites, they're really quite convinced that technology is playing a major role in terms of growing inequality in the US. So uh, some research that's gotten a lot of attention by an economist named Darren Asimoglu, he reports that as much as 50% of the growth in wage inequality, so we're not talking about inequality overall, but inequality in wages in particular, um, that that's attributable to automation. So that's kind of a, an extreme view, probably the, the most, the high estimate um, of the link between uh, inequality and automation. Whereas others say, look, there are so many factors that are at play here in terms of trends and inequality, um, and they're really hard to disentangle, even though we try to do that through all kinds of sophisticated quantitative methods, these, these, these factors are really difficult to separate. Um, and among those factors that scholars think are important in playing some role here, even if it's hard to quantify the precise extent of it, would be the decline of, of unions, um, certainly globalization, which is something I'm going to talk about more, 
Um, and one of the arguments that these folks make is that, look, you know, technology is not only not new, computers have been kind of around a long time, um, automation in various forms has been around literally since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, um, but they also say it's not a uniquely American phenomenon, right? A, a, much of the technology um, that we're seeing that we think is so transformative is um, being implemented in lots of different countries. And if you look at, for example, Europe, even though a lot of the technological change is happening there, the growth and inequality has been much less pronounced. So their, their kind of point is context matter, institutions matter in terms of the effect of this technology on inequality. So I think this line of argument, and I, I probably would align myself um, with it more than an extreme kind of optimistic or techno-pessimist view. One line of argument is that it's not technology itself necessarily that drives changes, or at least it's not the technology itself that can, that can sort of predict how things are going to play out um, in the lives of workers and communities. It's really how that technology is harnessed in a particular industry or a particular market setting. Um, some of the technology that we sort of see um, researchers call like so-so technology. You know, it, it might kind of change things on the margin, but it's not really that transformative. Um, and you know, that technology, so-so technology, we could think of as sort of incremental change in like building a better mousetrap. But capitalism is not necessarily about building a better mousetrap. What drives dynamism and growth um, really isn't kind of incremental improvement. It tends to be paradigmatic change. Um, and there's a wonderful book from 1942 by the Austrian economist Joseph Schumpeter called Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. And what Schumpeter, the, to the, the term that Schumpeter claimed very famously in this book is creative destruction. And he basically said that what is really distinctive and important about capitalism as a kind of political, economic, and social system is that it is uniquely able to stimulate innovation, really radical innovation of a kind that's so transformative it can wipe out right, sort of entire industries or entire ways of doing things. And he actually, that wipeout metaphor um, is really appropriate. Schimperter calls these, this, this process waves or gales of creative destruction, kind of like a, a massive wave sort of breaking on the shore. Um, and I think Schimperter's point, uh, now a very old point, is a really important one. It's not necessarily the technology itself, it's sort of the effect um, that it has and how it's organized in a particular context. So if we take something like Uber, right, there's a lot of interest in Uber as a kind of new technology. Some people might argue it is a kind of wave of creative destruction breaking over, let's say, the traditional taxi industry, right? Um, but if we think about Uber, one thing that gets a lot of attention about Uber, Uber is the platform itself. Right, sometimes referred to as like algorithmic governance. It's this matching technology that allows drivers and riders to find each other. That is what Uber brings. That is, that is new. There, there's no existing uh, ride sharing or taxi companies prior to Uber that had sort of mastered that particular kind of algorithmic matching. But in terms of the implications long term of Uber, both the success of the company, but also potentially its implications for drivers and riders. What's really important about Uber's business model is that it also was premised right, on um, a bet about how we would classify Uber drivers. Right? And so Uber was um, basically predicting that it would fly to consider Uber drivers not as employees of Uber, but as independent contractors. And the whole kind of business model, the, the, the ability of the company certainly to sort of ultimately in the long run make money, um, as well as its you know, kind of um, current valuation was based on this idea that uh, that, that would work. That you could have all of these people driving cars, driving their own cars for Uber, but Uber wouldn't have to consider them or treat them as employees. They would instead be independent contractors. And now there are cases, legal cases that are going forward that are sort of testing that bet. Right? So again, legal context matters. There's the technology which is important, which is the, the algorithmic governance that creates the matching, but the model, the, the context in which that technology is applied really, really matters 
and the fate of the company in some sense is kind of bound up with the degree to which that legal context in terms of employment law and our interpretation of who's a worker and who's an independent contractor, that also really, really matters for the company. Okay, so um, I wanna just spend a little bit of time. So context matters, kind of legal and institutional context, but geography also matters in terms of where this technology is, putting, uh, is being put into practice and the technology that sort of links together different parts of the production process. So I wanna talk about something um, that I spend a lot of time thinking about, which has been in the news a lot recently, um, which is global value chains. That's what kind of academics tend to call global supply chains, and there's a reason for that, as I'll talk about in a second, is because we tend to really wanna focus in on where the value is distributed across the supply chain, because that's really important um, for understanding in particular, the prospects that globalization poses for developing countries. But the reason that everybody's talking, of course, about global value chains or global supply chains is because of the bottlenecks um, and a lot of debate about the degree to which bottlenecks in supply chains is, if not fueling, at least contributing significantly to inflation. So the idea of a global value chain is really simple. If you think about, um, if you think about you know, the sweater that you're wearing, right? Um, and you look at the tag of that sweater, it's gonna say made in Pakistan, you know, made in China, right? It's very, very unlikely to say made in the United States. And that sweater then is the end product of a value chain that starts in some sense conceptually with the design of the garment, right? But in terms of the material inputs, starts uh, for lots of garments with cotton, with the cultivation of cotton, which is then spun into thread, which is then woven or knitted into a fabric, which is then cut, which is then sewn, which is then shipped and distributed. Okay, so that's, that's the idea of the value chain, that there are all of these different steps. And there's two super important things to know about um, the way that global value chains have kind of changed um, the economy. One is that increasingly, that global value chain is located in different countries, right? So if you bought this, a sweater, in 1955, right? It is possible that all of those steps in the value chain would have been done domestically, would have been cotton grown in Texas, right? That was produced in uh, a textile mill in maybe North Carolina, and then sewn in a garment factory in New York, right? And then went out to retail outlets in the US. Nowadays, it's very, very unlikely, right? That any of the supply chain uh, of the garment that you're wearing was done in the US, except for maybe that that pre-production part of design and the post-production part um, of marketing and retail, right? So this is relevant because when kinks in the, the supply chain happen, right, you get bottlenecks. Um, and that's part of what we've seen since COVID and what we're all kind of trying to figure out. Now, the bottlenecks in something like a garment are one thing. The bottlenecks in a Boeing airplane, right, or an automobile or an iPhone, right, many, many, many more components, many more components coming from different places. That's where we tend to see a lot of the bottlenecks happening. And this is just a graph from a World Bank report that's trying to sort of explain, um, in a sense, how things get kind of jammed up um, and why it is that global value chains in some ways increase the risks of dislocations in one particular place. So if, um, if you might remember, there was an earthquake, um, a tsunami in Japan years ago, and that actually had a relatively short-lived, a relatively temporary, but significant impact on the automobile global value chain because there were parts that weren't manufactured um, that couldn't get out to the rest of the value chain. When we think about something like COVID, which was a global shock in some sense to, to the global economy, then the ramifications of that um, really are gonna take much longer to sort of um, to play out. So we've been hearing a lot about um, COVID. And COVID sort of intersected with other important stuff that was happening that affects um, the global economy. And one of those things was actually kind of increased um, sort of concerns around trade policy, um, and in particular, Trump administration decisions around um, trade policy that folks thought might actually have an impact in discouraging the proliferation of more global value chains. And some, there was a lot of debate about how much, in particular, heightened tension with China would actually maybe drive 
reshoring back to the United States, right? That some manufacturing would come back to the U.S. because companies would get, um, you know, worried about their access to parts of the supply chain that were being made in China, or they were worried about, you know, import market restrictions. So that debate um, was happening. Um, but there was also something going on that was kind of a longer term trend, um, which I think has taken some time for us to kind of recognize. But what this, this chart is showing you, essentially, it's kind of a, a graph showing the extent of um, trade that is, or production that is organized through global value chains. So essentially what it's showing you is, OK, what percentage of, of products in, in particular economies are using inputs that are coming from other countries and are being fed into right, um, products that are being produced yet in other countries. Right? So this is kind of like one way to think about it is sort of like intermediate goods trade. And what this is showing you is that you know, kind of as you would expect, all through the 1990s, in some ways, the 1990s and uh, early 2000s was sort of the height of the acceleration of globalization of the development of these global supply chains across lots of different kinds of lots of different kinds of products, lots of different kinds of industries. But what you see here is that it peaks in 2007, 2008, right? So what happens at that point? That's essentially the global financial crisis. And what we see is that we have not yet had a recovery to that earlier peak in the degree to which global value chains are really defining kind of the world of trade, right? So this matters for all kinds of reasons, including, again, as I'll talk about in a second, the prospects for developing countries that are trying to link into these global value chains as a way to grow, but also for uh, where our stuff comes from and the degree to which there are, uh, there are folks in the US that are making that stuff. So I, again, I want to emphasize I, lots of the debate around COVID and trade policy, all of that is very important. And there are, are important ongoing changes. And there is real evidence that some more reshoring is happening. Uh, we could talk a bit about what the constraints to that are. They include actually things like um, not a ton of people in the US having the skills anymore to do the kinds of jobs that are, that are coming back. Um, but I think we also need to kind of step back and see that some of these trends were actually happening before, right, before COVID. Um, and they might suggest, in that sense, that they're going to they're gonna continue. Right? This might not be a short-lived um, short bleep um, in what many of us had just kind of assumed was going to be a long-term secular increase in economic globalization and the increased reliance on global value chains to deliver goods and services. OK. So in some sense, you know, when you think about this, you could argue, OK, from the vantage point of if the decline in global value chain participation can be interpreted as, let's say, an increase in domestic production, right? a reshoring to the US, but not just to the US, to other advanced economies too, right? let's say in Japan or, or Europe. You could say, OK, from the vantage point of like domestic jobs, that could be really great. Right? Um, for those of us who tend to work in um, the global south, in developing countries, it's actually a worrisome trend. And the reason is because of the way that the global value chain is shaped. So this is the so-called global value chain smile curve. And what it's showing you is basically the different links in the chain. And then conversely, and you'll notice this is the obverse shape, the employment that's generated in those different links in the chain, right? So the conventional story we had was, OK, you see this global value chain. The, the beginning and the end, the dimples in the smile curve, that's sort of where most of the developed countries are. That's like the sandbox in which they're playing, right? Apple is not, is doing, is, Apple is not fabricating components for, supply phone, for iPhones. They're certainly not, like Apple is not itself assembling those components into an iPhone. That is not what Apple is interested in. What Apple wants to do is basically the research, design, development of the technology, and then obviously the branding and the marketing of the final product. Everything else in between right, is happening in a global value chain that reaches to many parts of the countries and relies really, really heavily on a company like Foxconn 
which is a Taiwanese-based multinational, that is the company that actually does the assembly of the components of the iPhone in lots of different countries, right? China for sure, but also other countries in, um, in Latin America, South Asia, and, and even Africa. Now, the bottom of the smile curve, right? This is the labor-intensive production part of the process. These are the folks who are actually fabricating the components, and especially at the very bottom of the smile curve, the folks who are putting those pieces together, right? They're just assembling the pieces into the iPhone. What you notice when you look at the employment share of the global value chain is most of the jobs right, are actually there. It's these labor intensive production parts of the chain that are generating lots of employment, that have been generating lots and lots of employment in economies like China or, um, or Vietnam or in an earlier period, maybe a country like um, Mexico. And for those of us who study development, the way that we tend to think of this is, OK, you're trying to get in on the bottom of the smile curve, but eventually, if you're a, a Mexico, right? You don't want to be stuck assembling iPhones. You want to move up that value chain. You want to start to maybe do some of your own research and development, right? Or you might want to move to another industry like autos, where even the production process itself might create more opportunities for development or what we call upgrading. So the takeaway here, right, is that if automation potentially could be displacing the production workers that are at that bottom part of the smile curve, that part of the supply chain. The worry is it could actually kind of kick countries off the ladder of development. Right? That's kind of where countries start. For a long time, development has been synonymous with industrialization. And if those, if those new technologies are displacing workers that would do those labor-intensive manufacturing jobs in developing countries, Right? Um, that's really worrisome. Um, I spend a lot of time in countries like you know, Bangladesh or Nicaragua looking at how it is that um, companies in those countries are trying to access value chains. And there's lots of worries about um, the quality of the jobs in something like an apparel factory in Bangladesh, which we can talk about. But there's also pretty good evidence that the kids of garment workers in Bangladesh, for example, um, you know, tend to have better health outcomes. Right, than those who don't, than, than kids whose parents maybe don't have access to formal employment. So again, though much of the conversation around automation, technological change, inequality has focused on the US, and those are super important um, concerns and questions. For those who think about development, we're also thinking about the, the flip side of that in terms of what could this mean for the growth of these developing economies overall. Um, this is just a, a, a quote from Aaron Beninoff, who's a researcher um, who does a lot of work on this. And, and essentially, what he's pointing to is um, precisely this possibility. S things like sewing have been really, really hard, actually, to automate historically. The technology of clothing production has not changed dramatically since basically the 19th century. Right? There's been some changes for sure. There's, you know, laser cutters now to, to kind of cut garment. Uh, to cut fabric into garment pieces. But you know, if you go into a garment factory, what you see are mostly women sitting behind sewing factories, sewing garments. And what Beninoff is suggesting is that if there's something like a sobot, right, which is a trademark term, by the way, that could displace those folks, that's really worrisome. And I should say right, that this is, um, this would be a really, really potentially consequential thing. So there's, there's 15 estimated, 15 million garment workers in China alone. right? But rising rates in China have actually encouraged already. This is the way globalization works. It's already encouraged the relocation of garment manufacturing to other countries. China doesn't really want to be uh, in the sewing business anymore. It wants to, it, and it has successfully kind of moved up the value chain in a variety of ways. There's 12 million garment workers in India, uh, for example, and there's 4 million in Bangladesh. And one of the newest countries that, have, that has entered the ranks of global garment exporters is actually Ethiopia. Um, and so the scenario here that Beninov is, is kind of entertaining is one where automation by sewing, right, the, the so-called the, the automation of sewing by sobots kind of undercuts Ethiopia. Because what does Ethiopia have to offer? Well, it has to offer inexpensive labor. Right? And if that labor is no longer as much of a competitive advantage, 
because so much of the work is now being automated, that could potentially really um, dampen the prospects uh, of this country to develop. And I should just mention here briefly that SOBOTs, this is actually kind of what SOBOTs were intended to do. In 2002, the US Congress passed something called the Barry Amendment, which required the US military to purchase domestically um, produced uniforms. The Army is a big employer, right? It's got about 3 million employees. Now, that kind of buy American policy has been really challenging to implement, though, because 97% of the clothing that we buy in the US is imported, including the vast majority of work apparel like uniforms. So in 2012, the military's Defense Advanced Research Projects, Projects Agency, DARPA, awarded a $1.3 million grant to a startup called Software Automation at Georgia Tech. Um, and the grant was to develop robotic sewing machines that could produce garments with zero direct labor. SOBOTs are the result of that investment. Now, to be clear, I, there's a long, there's, SOBOTs are a long way from actually being able to produce a complex garment like a military uniform. Military uniforms are not t-shirts. Um, that's what they're currently producing is t-shirts. Um, and it's important to note, too, that the goal of really having zero direct labor hasn't been reached because still, even to produce the t-shirts, you need one um, worker to operate sort of four machines. But the worry, I think, that's being expressed by somebody like Beninov and others who study this, um, particularly folks at the International Labor Office in Geneva, where I do some work, is that eventually this technology is going to advance to the point that SOBOTs will be able to produce more complex garments and that they will do so with little or no human labor. So if garment workers in Africa that are producing clothing for, let's say, Zara, a, a woman's brand, um, if they can basically, uh, if they're basically displaced, right, um, by, by SOBUTs, that could be a kind of kicking away of the industrialization ladder that other countries have, have successfully climbed. And I want to just end with a, a, a final slide, which I think really reinforces, again, why this is important, potentially, right? This is, um, these are estimates that the ILO has provided of total informal employment, okay? So informal employment, um, basically means folks that are not working in what we would consider a standard employment contract. The ILO is estimating that there are about 2 billion people aged 15 and over who are engaged in informal employment. That's about 61% of the world's population. Now, what that means varies across different countries because the levels of social protection that are provided to informal workers varies. Um, but what this available data suggests um, is that there is lots of people who need formal jobs um, as a way to generate income, uh, as a way to kind of produce a livelihood for their families, but also in the long run, right, we know from history that that kind of formal employment tends to be, right, about climbing that ladder of industrialization um, and development. So I, I hope that, um, if nothing else, uh, my goal is always to leave my students with the sense that um, it's more complicated than, than we might think, that what's happening in terms of technological change certainly does have a technical component, but it's also got a geographical component. It's got an organizational component. And some of those changes, as important as they are for us, and as much as our discourse tends to focus on, on the implications of that for the US and other advanced economies, um, the developing world um, is also very much potentially going to be um, affected by these changes and the possible gales of creative destruction that will be breaking on their shores. And finally, and most importantly, and I say this um, as a Virginia alum, but also, or, or sorry, as a, Virgi as a Virginian, uh, but also as a Duke alum, Go Who's Beat Carolina. Thank you. I did. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Hello. Hi. Uh, I, I look at the globalization and the international treatment of it. I, I in a way, I almost see how there were examples of the globalization, but purely in, in the United States, from the, the uh, uh, lack of technological change at some uh, cities for their steel industry, mm. and how some of that moved to different states. 
And at the different states, they had the technological innovations that reduced the workforce, but created an underlying economy that made that state even greater. Yep. Uh, uh, and I, I, I just wonder, uh, is there a way to soften that blow by adding technology up front, uh, and does that have to be a government thing? And just the second aspect of it is I see a little bit of that happening with uh, the microchips and how we're investing in large microchips in uh, Northern Virginia, uh, Wisconsin, I believe, uh, and how that has taken, however, a huge federal subsidy to spawn it. And whatever comments you have on those two areas. Yeah, it's a really great question. And I think that the comment that you made about, if you think about something like you know, steel manufacturing, right? there is still steel manufacturing in the US, but it's specialty steel manufacturing. It's done, some of it is done um, you know, in the Ohio Valley and in places that, that you know, produce steel historically. But it's being done in state-of-the-art factories that employ many, many fewer people right? because of the technology. So I think when we think about the reshoring, there may be, there may be good reasons to be excited about reshoring, um, about the infusion of investment and capital into communities. We should not assume that that is necessarily going to move the dial very significantly in terms of manufacturing employment because so much of that reshoring is in capital intensive right, manufacturing that is not necessarily going to generate a ton of jobs. Um, the question about, I think the question about what are the policy levers, right, that the government has, does it have to be direct investment? Um, I mean, trade policy clearly is one thing that we've seen does matter in terms of how um, companies are thinking about where they want to produce and where they want to make investments. There is also an argument about, um, an increasing argument actually about um, the need for more regulation and in particular better um, enforcement of competition policy because the concerns are that at the top of the supply chain where you have big buyers, so much concentration has happened um, that this is having a negative impact further down the supply chain and there needs to be a kind of more muscular enforcement of say like antitrust to stimulate the kind of competition that would ultimately be good um, for um, for countries and, and communities that are kind of competing for those sorts of jobs and enable them to get maybe more value, to extract more value from that link um, in the chain. So I think increasingly we're going to see, you know, the conversation shift maybe a little bit from that sort of like direct support to um, the regulatory environment that might encourage different kinds of, of investment, increased investment, et cetera. Right here. So I'm just thinking about what you're saying in terms, I'm 66, in terms of industries being uh, successful. And also I remember the transition of like looking at my labels and saying, oh my gosh, yeah. what, where is this coming from? Uh, but we had fair trade, we had sort of, but right now I'm thinking about climate and you know, Always the industries pick up when people, it's a, it's a popular thing to buy something, for instance, uh, made out of hemp. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, in 2019 when Virginia opened up, I, I actually started a business called um, Replenish Agency Team or something like that. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that we suddenly have this glut of material because people are smoking it or whatever they're doing with it. <laughs> but that sort of thing where you can grow, for instance, uh, certain types of replenishing plants in, in places like Ethiopia or whatever, and then use that material and make it popular here to buy that clothing and that sort of thing. Isn't that what happened when we all found this country and they started shipping spices and all that sort of stuff? Why can't we be thinking about that instead of things that are, uh, you know, uber? No, it's a really good question. I mean, I, I, it makes me think about a, a lot of different things, including in some ways how, like as you say, in a way, like globalization has been going on essentially, you know, literally from the beginning of, of this country, right? This country's creation was, was part in some sense of a, of a much earlier phase of globalization. I, I think you also touched on a really, really important point, which is um, actually 
um, environmental factors. There's a whole bunch of folks now who are working on global value chains from the vantage point of the ecological footprint of something like a standard value chain, right? Because stuff is getting shipped multiple times um, you know, uh, around the world in some cases. And there's a huge carbon footprint to that, the transportation and logistics portion. Um, you know, that in a sense, there's transportation logistics as, as a kind of intermediate link between each of the links as products move through um, this value chain. So I, there, I wouldn't say that I'm super optimistic that we are on the verge of having a, a kind of um, national, let alone sort of international answer to the problem um, of the impact of global supply chains on um, on um, environmental pressures, but it is at least something that folks are, are definitely kind of talking about. Um, and to some degree, to be honest, it fluctuates a little bit. Companies tend to be more concerned about this when the price of oil is high, um, because it's a cost issue, right? It's a bottom line issue, not just, um, not just an ecological one. But I, I do think this is a trend um, that we will see continue into the future, kind of thinking about, OK, what does, how do we, how do we value into the value chain in some sense? Right, the, the costs to the environment of this particular model of global trade and production. Can't hear you. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Yeah, so the question was basically, how do we think about the creation of kind of parallel value chains that are maybe explicitly not global, but national for national security reasons? And how far, how far is that likely to develop? And what might, um, and how to think about that in relationship to essentially the rise of China, right? So there is no doubt that, um, you know, something shifted in the thinking about um, the role of China in global value chains. Um, I think for a long time, so, so China sort of opens to the global economy. The first special economic zone in China opens in 1980. Um, and at the time, these special economic zones were like literally zones um, where factories were producing for export. And it was kind of like an island, you could think. Um, and in a way, it was kind of like an island of like very circumscribed capitalism or market activity in the context of a state socialist economy. Um, those special economic zones they weren't the only thing that was driving growth in China, but they were a really important part of it. Um, and the export growth in China has really propelled that country's kind of uh, upgrading along the value chain, right? So China is no longer, I think sometimes we still tend to think about the fact this is a huge country um, with relatively low wage labor, which is true, but it's also a country that has done a pretty good job of climbing the value chain. Um, and you know, it does not necessarily want to, again, be in the sandbox of sewing garments uh, with Ethiopia. It wants to be, it, it wants to basically be um, nurturing its own social media companies, for example, um, and other kinds of tech companies, um, and competing more, more directly, more head on with um, US and other traditional Western um, firms. Um, so I think the, the concern about national security and the rise of domestic value chains is very much linked to the increased understanding and perception of the, um, you know, of the challenge that China's successful industrialization poses to the US. And in particular, the degree to which China in particular industries had become extremely dominant as a production location for certain kinds of products, right? So you know, there's a national security dimension to that that has to do with the geopolitical rivalry and tension between China and the US. There's also, it's also true that companies themselves, private companies, that are not necessarily concerned about national security, but are very much concerned about supply chain bottlenecks, are realizing that having such a reliance on a single location um, to produce a really critical component is just risky, right, for their own profitability and their own um, production. So there's a kind of diversification that is happening. In some industries, I've heard it as China plus three or China plus five, meaning companies don't necessarily expect to get out of China entirely. It's such an important production location in certain industries, but they want to have three or five other production sites, one of which could be the US, where they um, have a kind of more secure or more reliable um, you know, source 
uh, of components. It's basically just a risk sharing strategy um, that you want to be sure that you're not overly dependent on any one particular location. industry started to um, get taxed for tariffs for shipping stuff from China. So you know what they did? And I know this behind the scenes. I'm, I'm not going to tell you how. Um, they actually manufactured, because the computers there in China were like state of the art. So they, they were able to get all the information for, like, for instance, the vaccines and things like that. Those, those labs were amazing. Um, so what they would do, the biotech industry, is they would make them in China, the, the, the pills or whatever, vaccines, serums, chemotherapy, everything. And then they would ship them to India so that they wouldn't get taxed from China. Yeah, the, the issue of transshipment and sort of the playing, this is a very old game. Um, but the, the process of transshipment is one that, you know, I think there, there is a real effort to try to get a handle on where products are actually made. And there are different rules in different industries. It's really important if you think about something like, um, it's important in the context of global trade generally, but it's particularly important in the context of like preferential trade agreements, right? Because products made in Mexico are supposed to have preferential access to the US under the North American Free Trade Agreement. The question is, what's actually made in Mexico, right? And how much of the components of what's assembled in Mexico and exported to the US are actually coming from somewhere else? So there are rules of origin in trade agreements that try to police this and basically say, OK. And, and one of the big renegotiations of what is now called the US-Mexico-Canada Free Trade Agreement, but basically like NAFTA 2.0, one of the things that the Trump administration did was increase um, the, the, the rules of origin, the con the, basically the content requirements um, in, for certain products to get access to the US market. This was particularly important in autos. Um, and basically what the, what the agreement, the new agreement said is a certain percentage um, of the value added in Mexico has to come from, from labor, because sort of set a percentage. And the idea was, you know, we want to we, we want to limit the degree to which Mexico can compete with US auto plants on the basis of labor. And so it was sort of, it was in some ways kind of forcing uh, an increase in wages and the wage level um, in Mexico, albeit in a modest degree, um, to try to address that. So there's lots of fascinating, fascinating um, kind of, in some sense, stealth value chains that are actually you know, attempting to circumvent some of these rules and um, general market restrictions or policies under the global trade regime. And there's people who are working, folks are working on technology to try to stay ahead of that, but it's really, really difficult. My question is, what do you see happening uh, to the Twitter employees that, whose jobs are yeah. being eliminated? What opportunities are, are there for them, and where do you think most of them will, will end up? I think they're going to be OK. Uh, I mean, what's fascinating is I know about this largely because they report it on Twitter, <laughs> sort of on their way out the door, which is already kind of interesting. Um, I think, you know, I think there, those folks as individuals presumably have um, human capital and what sociologists would, would also think of as kind of social capital in terms of sort of their networks. They're, you know, they will probably um, be able to find um, good jobs elsewhere. Huge caveat, right? Um, but I think there is a lot of the concern around consolidation um, and market pressure is looking at tech industries. Um, and there is concern that you know, you might have a, com a company like Twitter become so dominant, right, that it actually really could affect not just the prospects of, you know, kind of former employees to find work elsewhere because they can always shift maybe to a slightly different industry, but it certainly affects the experience of the consumers, right, who are using that technology. So I think that the debate about the regulatory environment is really at this point, it, you know, it's, it's, it's to some degree targeting large 
retailers, particularly platform retailers like Amazon, but it's also very much, I think, attuned to what's happening in some of the spaces of sort of the digital economy around social media and the degree to which um, you know, we, we, we may not, precisely because of the way that the algorithm operates, right, which is, it's just, which is based on increasing the number of users, right, that it may, um, that it may limit the degree to which you can have competition. Um, and that could have all kinds of impacts, not just on price, but I think as much of the debate about Twitter has kind of highlighted on just the content, right, of what's being made available. Yeah, so I'm going to ask, I'm going to answer your question, um, which is about the class. And so I want to say, so I now I've started a, a position as associate dean, so I'm not teaching right now. Um, and although I, I really like this job, I do miss being in the classroom, and I'm, I'm hoping to kind of sneak a course in, um, you know, soon. But the last course that I taught before taking this position was a course called Democracy and Inequality. And what was unique about it was that it was a team-taught course. There were four professors. It was myself, um, and I'm a sociologist, Sonal Pandya in politics, Karam Kosar in economics, and Bob Brunner from, um, from the Darden School of Business. So we basically designed this class to, to try to make um, the point that the theme of inequality and the relationship between democracy and democratic processes and democratic institutions and inequality is both extremely important but also really complex. And you need to actually have these different perspectives, right, from the world of business, from, from, from politics, from economics, from sociology, to really try to grapple with not just what's happening, but also what are, um, what are the things that we should be you know, worried about or trying to do to sort of shore up um, democracy and think about how um, democracies can be more um, attentive to concerns around inequality. So that was a super fun class to teach. I learned a ton um, because essentially, you know, we did two classes. We did the class for each other, getting ready for the class, where we sort of thought about how we were going to try to to just manage four people in a classroom. Um, we had a really fun. We really wanted it to be interactive, um, and it was a big class. So we were trying to figure out how to make it interactive. We had like a little um, microphone in what looked like a Nerf football that we sort of threw across the classroom to encourage students to sort of speak um, in lecture format. I actually hit a student in the head with the Nerf ball at some point, so I, I, I proceeded not to throw the Nerf ball anymore. I left that to my, left that to my, uh, my colleagues with better aim. But, um, but really, I think the, the, the secret of it for me was a kind of reminder that you know, even something that I think that I know a lot about, so a lot of what I did in the class was talk a little bit about um, you know, this whole question of economic transformation and globalization and the social consequences and dynamics of that, something that I thought I knew a lot about, I learned so much, you know, from my colleagues that really changed the way that I think about it. And we just tried to pass a little bit of that, you know, on to the students um, in uh, encouraging them to think broadly. Because the challenges that we face, you know, I am a sociologist and I, of course, um, love sociology, but I'm also realistic about the degree to which you need different disciplinary perspectives, different kinds of methods, different ways of seeing the world in order to grapple with the really, really important questions um, that today's generation of students and all of us are going to face going forward. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much. Oh. Um, on behalf of Lifetime Learning and the Alumni Association, we must say thank, thank you, Jen Baer, for speaking to thank us you. today. And thank you all for joining and in person and online. Um, but before you leave, we have a special announcement. Um, one of our regular participants, Bob Belton, his birthday is today. So happy birthday, Bob. <laughs> To you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Bob, happy birthday to you. Thank you. I hope you and Celia have a great day. Enjoy the game everybody and grab, there's a few more bagels and coffee from Red Hub. Grab one on your way out. <laughs>